Good morning, Sacred Exchange. Happy Resurrection Sunday. And isn't it good to be in the house this morning? Doesn't this lovely group just look absolutely beautiful? All right, why don't we stand? We're going to open up. We've got a, a really wonderful morning plan this morning. We're going to open up with a fun song. We got some other fun stuff going on, so let's open up in prayer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for the presence of God in this room. We thank you for the glorious day that this represents, Lord, the, the beautiful day of, of resurrection and, and the power of resurrection that we have in our lives through your Son, Christ. And Father, we pray that you would move in this service, God, that you would cover it from beginning to end, Lord. We ask, Father, that you would just invade our hearts, our minds, and our souls, God, that you would just come and make your home, make our hearts your dwelling place, Father. We want to be your temple. So, Father, I pray that you would come and move upon the lives of your people, draw people unto you, we pray. We ask that Jesus would be magnified, not ourselves, not our skills or talents, God, but Christ be magnified in this place. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my turn till I met you. You called.
Amen. Did they do a great job, church? All right. All right, so with that, we've got a, a special presentation this morning. You can go ahead and take your seats. Thank you, choir.
Amen. Can we give it up once again for that skit? Jesus is alive. Hey, somebody say, he has risen. He has risen. He has risen. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. He has risen. Man, what a, what a blessing that is for us. Hallelujah. Hey, just a couple of quick announcements this morning. Um, don't forget L denominations. Are, uh, are due by April 11th, and you can put your nominations in the basket, or you can give them to Marissa. Uh, Sila Ladies Prayer and Worship Night, that's April 9th. That's this Friday coming up at 6.30. So ladies, 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 come and uh, pray together because um, we need your prayers, amen? And, uh, hey, we have a family game dinner and cornhole tournament. So the men are going to do our cornhole tournament again and, and game dinner and dinner and we're actually opening it up for our families to come. So we're going to make it a church day, amen? And for some of you guys that have never tasted any of my barbecue, we might get a little bit that day. Can I have the ushers come forward for tithes and offering? Can we all stand? You know, this morning I was uh, awoken, and I was just thinking about Resurrection Day, and the Spirit was kind of leading me to, to think about his, Jesus has arisen. And, you know, so often during this course of this week of Easter, we, we grieve over the grave. We grieve over the cross. But the truth is, is that there's nothing on the cross, and there's nothing in the grave because he's risen. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you this morning. Lord, that you planned this all out from the beginning. Lord, that your son would come, Lord, and he would pay the price for us, for our sins. Lord, that on the third day, Lord, he would rise. Lord, that many would see him, and then he would come and sit at your right hand. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for all that you have done for us. And, Lord, we thank you this morning for these offerings, Lord, and these tithes, Lord. And we just pray a blessing upon them, Lord. And we pray a blessing upon everyone here in this service, Lord. And, Lord, we pray for those that might be here for the first time. Lord, we pray that you have a blessed time with us this morning, Lord. And that, Lord, your truth and your revelation would come upon them this morning. Lord, have your way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Come on, let's worship. Satan fall like lightning And I saw darkness run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders And I have resurrection power Sons and daughters We're bought with blood and washed in water Oh, sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father Our God will finish what He started Come on, church Our God will finish what He started This is my testimony From death to life Cause grace 
Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Oh, you, you picked me up. You turned me around. You placed my feet on the solid ground. I thank the master. I thank the savior. Yes, you healed my heart. And you changed my name. I'm forever
sing it one more time. I'll praise the Lord. Let's do it again. Ready? Isn't it nice having a choir? What a great job. We can get spoiled real easy. <laughs> you can be seated for a moment. It was just last year that we were having TV church. We weren't even in the backyard yet. We hadn't even graduated. And uh, I have a little clip from last year's Easter or resurrection service to remind us of, of that day. It's early in the morning. And I'm here. The Sabbath has passed. It's the first day. I'm here among the dead. I'm looking for him. I'm looking for my Lord. Where have they laid him? I don't know how I'll move the stone. I don't know how I'll do it. Where have they put him? Where could he be? Wait, wait, the stone, the stone is moved, it's moved away, where is he, he's gone, he's not here, he's not here, wait, where have you taken him? Where is he? Why do you seek the dead among the living? He's not here. He's risen. The tomb is empty. Go. Tell his disciples he is risen. I messed up that day. I said, why do you seek the living or the dead among the living? But it's actually, why do you seek the living among the dead? And uh, I have a sermon this morning called Death Undone. It's from Hosea, chapter 13 and verse 14. It's a verse that I, I came across and looked up back when the whole COVID thing first started. And I thought that, I didn't know, I, I listened to what people were saying. I says, I'm going to save this verse because it's a verse for a funeral. It's a verse for a funeral for someone that has passed away from COVID. And didn't know at the time, they wouldn't even let us have funerals. It's Hosea chapter 13 and verse 14. And I want to 
read it. I'm spoiled. So spoiled. <laughs> yeah. I want to read it to you. You can stand if you like. Hosea. Hosea is the first book of the minor prophets. It comes right after Daniel. It's 12 books before the New Testament, if that will help you. If not, it's one verse you can just listen on. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. And repentance shall be hid from my eyes. Father, add a blessing to your word this morning, I pray, on this wonderful resurrection day. Let us understand the power of the resurrection. Let us walk in it, God. Let us, let us understand who you are, what you've done, what you've paid, and who we are in you. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. You may be seated. <clears throat> it began on Thursday night. He was in the garden. He was wrestling, and he was praying continually one thing over and over. Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Over and over, he prayed that prayer. If there's any other way, let me take it. But let this cup pass from me. And it makes you wonder just what was in the cup. What was the horror of the cup that made him pray that way? And I want to let you know the cup that he took, the cup that he drank, and drank fully, drank it to the very dregs, was the cup of the wrath of God. It was the righteous judgment of God on sin, on rebellion, on people that he created that turned from him and wanted nothing to do with him. And the cup was full of your sin and my sin and your rebellion and my rebellion. The cup was full of all of our ways. And everything, and every evil, and every iniquity, and every horror that has been devised by man for eternity. And he looked at it, and he choked, and he cried, and he threw himself down, and he prayed, if it's possible, if there's anything else I can do, let me not have to drink this cup. But he drank it, and he drank it all. He drank of the wrath of God and finished that cup that we would not have to. That none of what was in that cup will apply to us anymore because he took it all. He took our sin, he became sin. He took the curse, he became the curse. He took death, he, be he died. He took everything, every hurt, every brokenness. And he became it as he drank that cup. And he died. He was tortured to death. And he gave himself up and died because he was taking our place. He was the vicarious substitutionary sacrifice. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He was the one who would stand in my place on judgment day and say he was guilty, but I pay it all. I will take his place. He would stand in your place on that day and say, you're guilty, but I take it all. He became death for us. He became the curse. They buried him and they sealed the tomb. They posted a Roman guard. I know it was not just one person, but it was a guard. It was a, a squad of Roman soldiers to watch that. And if anyone messed with it, it was their life and they knew it. No one stole that body. No one stole that body. 
except Jesus and the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Let me talk about death. Death is part of the human experience. We know from the very beginning, as we start to grow up and get old enough to understand why certain people are not around anymore, that death is part of life. It always has been and it always will be until he comes back and sets a new order in place. Death is just part of living. We have had many that have recently passed. I just got the word this morning that one of our dear friends who would come and sit right back there has just passed away. Just about. And um, I am frankly mad at death. Are you mad at death? It really has no place messing with us because it has been paid for, eradicated. He says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. And, oh, death, I will be your plague. We get all wrapped up and bent out of shape about plagues and plagues and plagues and and you know something, through the ages there have been many plagues. There have been scourges and wars and plagues and, and, and typhoid and yellow fever and, and, and things that have wiped out the black death, plagues that have decimated the human population. And God is saying to death, I am going to be your plague. You're going to wear a mask. You're going to hide out. You're going to not go to church anymore. <laughs> death, I'm going to be a plague to you. Let's talk about that. Right from the very beginning, I don't believe they were in the garden long at all. God told Adam, this you will not eat, and the day you eat of this you will die. He passed it on to Eve, and the devil came. And he does what he does because he is a liar and he is the father of lies. He is the initiator of lies. He is the inventor of lies. And everything he says is a lie in one way or another. He says, you will not surely die. And they ate and they died. They died immediately, spiritually. They died eventually, physically. And before they died physically, while in their death spiritually, they saw their two children, and one, Cain, killed the other, Abel. And they became very familiar with good and evil. They saw it, they tasted it, they smelled it. And Abel was murdered. The generation of Adam in Genesis chapter 5. It's very interesting. It gives the generations of Adam. Let me read just a little. Let me just peruse through it and share some of the highlights of Gen Genesis chapter 5 with you. This is the book of the generation of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness made he him. Male and female created he them. And he blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And all the days, I'm jumping to verse 5, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. They had Seth, and all the days of Seth were 920 years. And he died in verse 8. In verse 11, he had Enos, and Enos was 905 years, and he died. In verse 14, they had Canaan, and all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. And they had Mahalalel, and all the days of Mahalalel, in verse 17, were 890 and five years and he died. And there was, and there was Jared. And Jared was 960 and two years, and he died. Methuselah, 960 years, and he died. On 
and on and on. The generations of Adam, the book of the genealogy of man. And if Adam had a legacy, it's that, and he died. And his children died. And his children's children died. And his children's children's children died. And all that would be born into this world are born to die. But something changed around 2,000 years ago. Jesus came. And he became death that no more do we have that legacy of death. He took our place in death. Someone texted me a little while ago. hope he's watching this morning. And he asked me, at what point does eternal life begin? Does eternal life begin when you are born again? Or does eternal life begin after you go and are in the presence of the Lord. And my understanding is that eternal life begins the moment you accept Christ as your Savior. Because my Bible says that he, you who were dead in trespasses and sins, has he quickened, has he made alive? We are born again, he told Nicodemus. You have to be born again. Why do I have to be born again? Because you're a dead man walking. You are a dead man walking. You have to be born spiritually. You have to be born anew. You have to be made alive. You have to be made alive spiritually. We have eternal life in us the moment we accept Christ as our Savior. We live in it. We walk in it. Sometimes, we, sometimes we're deceived and we don't see it. We don't grab it. We don't pick it up. It's like a suit past the west way in the back of the closet that you had forgotten about. But it's there, it's ours, and it still fits. Amen. <laughs> yeah, that's always a big thing these days, huh? And it still fits. And I'm wearing it. I'm wearing it. Romans chapter 5. Verse 12, and then 17 and 19. Wherefore, by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed on all men, for that all have sinned. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came to all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men for the righteousness of life. Do you know that's the verse that, 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 that got me? That's the verse. That's the hook that pulled me into the boat. Oh, Peter, where are you? Messing with the ropes. We had to go change probably. That's the verse that caught this fish. And snagged him one day. There he is. <laughs> snagged him one day and pulled me into the boat. That whole idea of the free gift. That whole idea of he paid the price of my sins. That whole idea that I was a dead man walking. That I was just someone mocking time, waiting to drink my own cup. That he'd already drank for me. And the idea of that free gift, the idea of that eternal life, the idea of him paying for my price, the, my, the idea of a free gift. When I grew up, it, was nothing, it wasn't about free. It was about do this, do that. It was about work your way. And I could never work my way because as hard as I was of a worker, my sins outpaced me. I was so hard of a sinner that as hard as I was a worker... My sins always kept ahead of me. I could never catch them. But when Jesus paid, and he paid it all. He took care of death for me. He became death for me. And you might think it's resurrection day. And why am I so? Because it, without understanding death, without understanding the grave, without understanding the cup, without understanding the wrath of God and the weight of sinfulness that was upon us, we can't fully appreciate the the life 
the power of the resurrection and the goodness of God and what he did for us and what it means that he came out of that tomb. It's not just a story. It's not just happy Easter and a bunny and whatever. It's about he took my price and he went in that tomb but he came back out to show us that this is you. You were dead in trespasses and sins and the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now, as he came out of that tomb, I can come out of that tomb. We sang this song this morning. The devil lost another one. I am free. I am free. Yeah. He lost another one, and I am free. I have come out of that tomb. Because when he came out of that tomb, I came out of that tomb. If I can be guilty because of Adam's trespass, I can be free because of Christ's resurrection. And I am free because of what he's done. I am free because he became my sin and my curse and yours. And when he came forth in the newness of life, I'm like the little lambs, like the little children. You know how they see how they come up? One follows another. We get the first one to go, and then we all follow. I'm following Jesus. I'm following him. I'm just following along behind him. He's walking in life. He's coming out of the tomb. That tomb will not hold me down. That, they did not roll that stone away for him to get out. He went, they rolled the stone away for us to look in. He had no problem coming out of a, a sealed up tomb. He didn't have to move a stone. He didn't even have to move his powers and move the stone or blow the stone to bits. He walked right through the stone. He was in a locked room. They were hiding. They were in a locked, sealed room, hiding out, and he appeared in the midst. They didn't have to unlock the door for him. They had to unlock the door for Peter a few chapters later. They didn't have to unlock the door for Jesus. He appeared in the midst of the room. Acts chapter 1, he's talking with them. He's on the Mount of Olives. He's saying, guys, I'll see you. And he rose up into heaven as if they stood there gazing. And the angel, why, guys, why stand you gazing? The same Jesus that was taken up from you this day, he's coming back in like manner. He's coming back the same way he went up. He's coming back down to get you and take you with him. He was with them for 40 days. For 40 days, he demonstrated. He was seen over 500 witnesses that, that were witnesses to his resurrection that saw him. Thomas says, I will not believe. if I, if, I'm not going to believe. If I don't put my fingers in the holes in his hands, in his side, in the hole in his side, I won't believe. And Jesus said, Thomas, Thomas, my Lord, my God, go ahead, touch. You said you wouldn't believe. Touch. Touch. I want you to see it's me. I want you to see it's me. Death has no power over us because Jesus broke the power of death. He broke the curse. He broke the power. He broke the chains. He broke the bonds. He broke something that man had been in fear of and man is in fear of even to this day because we are taught from early that you cannot escape death. You cannot escape death. People have tried. They've tried to do it through every way imaginable you can think of. Spin the cat around three heads and throw it to the easterly direction at 7 p.m. in the morning or a.m. 7 p.m. in the morning. Try doing that, and and then you'll have eternal life. None of it works. None of it works. Why doesn't it work? Because we don't have power over that. But Christ had power. He says, I have the power to lay my life down. I have the power to take it back up again. You don't have the power, but Christ does. And because he did, we tag along with him. We're right on his coattails. And when he rose that day, he rose for all of us. 
And we have resurrection power. It's power that we walk in. Resurrection power is power that's coming. And one day he will crack the sky and call us home. We'll hear our voice. The trump will sound. It will be the assembly call. And we will all assemble and we will go up together to be with him. Now that's resurrection power. But you know what else is resurrection power? Right now, daily, every day, I walk and live and breathe and have my being in resurrection power. Every day, the tomb tries to hold me down. But it can't hold me down. The rock on the mouth of the tomb can't hold me in. The guards outside can't keep me back. The clothes that they wrap me in will not stop me. Remember Lazarus. He came hopping out that day Jesus called him for. He had to tell them, move the stone away. He can't walk through, he can't walk through stones yet. His day is coming, but this is not re- uh, resurrection. This is mere resuscitation. Roll the stone away for him. And when he came hopping out, now go and unwrap him. Loose him. He was like a mummy wrapped all up. You, can, you, know, you, you can't get out. It's like a straitjacket. It's like being duct taped up by the devil and thrown in the trunk of his old car because he has plans for you. But Jesus has come and the duct tape, duct tape breaks right off and the trunk all of a sudden has one of those little pop latches and you can pop right out. And we don't even have to roll down the road past the west and hope there's not a truck following the car. Because he's taking us out and live, making us free. Then we can live. Jesus didn't need anyone to unwrap him. That's one of the proofs of the resurrection. They looked in and they saw the grave clothes lying there. And they knew that he was not taken by someone. How do you unravel a mummy? John, if you came up here and I just started wrapping you up with bandages and we've just made you into a mummy and all the kids would come and poke you and play with you, how would you get out? How would you get free? You could grab one end and run and... (laughs) Right? You could cut the bandages off. You could burn them off or some other way. But how could he get out of those bandages without unwrapping them and making it obvious that someone took him. What happened, I believe, with Jesus is the same way he came out of that tomb. He came out of those grave clothes. And he left them wrapped perfectly, but he just stepped out of them. And they were wrapped like a mummy with nothing in it. And when John looked at that, he knew, he knew There's no way for him to get out of that. No one unwrapped him and wrapped it back up because you can't do it. He knew. Something's going on here. Something's happening here. Moved through the stone, moved through the wall, rose up to be with God. That's resurrection power. And I say that because the devil wants to put stuff on you and make you think you are so bound with grave clothes You cannot move. But I want you to know something. The Lord has given you resurrection power. It is not just something that's going to happen one day when he comes back. But we walk in resurrection power now. I leave those grave clothes behind. What is on your grave clothes? What is the label? It was quite a few years ago, Pastor Wester. The style was guys would get a new suit and, you know, the little tag that's right here. They would leave the tag on it. Well, you know, that was the style. I don't know the style. So one of the young guys at church, he's got the tag on his suit. I'm like, oh, yo, come here, come here. You've got the tag on your suit. Hey, you want to use a knife? Take that tag off. I'm like, what are you talking about, old man? I had to be 40 at the time. I was like an old geezer. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I, I don't know. That's the style. What's the label on your grave clothes? What does it say? Does it say grave clothes of pride? Does it say grave clothes of of hatred? Does it say grave clothes of unforgiveness? Does it say grave clothes by, by, uh, it doesn't say by Gucci. 
What does it say on those grave clothes? He walked out of them. And if you think that's not a big deal, what is the tombstone that is blocking you in? What is the gargantuan stone, a big, flat, round stone that's in a groove with a little hollow dug out? So you can roll it or get a lever and roll it, and then it falls into this groove. You ever get stuck in mud, and when your tires spin, they make a perfect groove right to the tire? And, and once that happens, you're pretty much done. You're pretty much done. You're shoveling, you're digging, you're doing, it's pretty much done. And this big stone would fall and roll into a groove that was perfectly carved out to the, to the shape of the stone. There are gravestones that hold us down. There are gravestones that hold us back. What's on the name of the stone? That, holds, that blocks off your tomb. What is on the name of the stone that blocks the tomb that you're in? The place where you're in that you think is so big and so heavy that no one could move. And frankly, you're right. It is so big and it is so heavy that no one can move it. And it's dropped down into a gully specially prepared for it just so it cannot be moved. And you can't move it. And no strong man can move it. The only thing that can move it is God, and he doesn't even move it. He just walks through it. He just walks through it. There's giant stones that are sitting on the back of some folks in here this morning, and I want to let you know, resurrection power, resurrection power, not that's coming, that's here. That's been here since Jesus came out of that tomb, is here, is alive as well, is powerful, is working in our lives. Amen. And we walk in resurrection power this morning. And no grave clothes can keep us tied, and no tombstone can hold us down. And no stationed guards at the outside can hold us back. And when they saw him, they fell as dead. There's a whole lot more to the resurrection of Jesus than Easter bunnies and lily flowers and beautiful tulips and, and ham and lasagna. <laughs> oh, I guess we're having stuffed shells today. <laughs> That's good. That'll do. There's a whole lot more to Easter because Easter for us is every day. Easter for us, the highlight of the Christian calendar because it marks what sets the whole thing apart. He came out of that tomb. He came out in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Chapter 15 of 2 Corinthians is the third longest chapter in the whole New Testament. And the only two that are longer are chapter 1 of Luke or chapter 2 of Luke and chapter 22 of Luke. Luke was a very prolific writer. Other than that, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians is the third longest chapter in the Bible. And it is a chapter devoted exclusively to the resurrection of Christ. I want to read just a couple verses in it. I want to read verse 21 and 22. For since by man came death, by man also the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. He talks about the change. He talks about what will happen. He talks about corruption, putting on incorruption. Mortality, putting on immortality. He talks about how then in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. We will see him. He's coming back for us. And then he quotes from two places doesn't really so much quote as he alludes to Isaiah and Hosea. And he says, past the saying that is written in verse 54, death is swallowed up in victory. And when Isaiah says that death is swallowed up in victory, he's thinking, he's thinking of something that we're not familiar with. 
He's thinking of the legends and the myths of those people around Israel. He's thinking of their understanding of this great devourer, the thing that it was like a black hole, this God that was like a black hole. Anything that got even close got sucked in. It said that his mouth of the great devourer, the bottom lip went all the way to the bottom of the ocean, and the top was all the way to the top of the mountains, and everything was sucked into this great devourer. And so Paul, or, or Isaiah, in looking at that, and Paul picking up on that says, death is swallowed up in victory. The great swallower, the great swallower of all mankind, the one that no one could escape from. I know about Enoch and Elijah. But we're not sure what's going to happen with them yet. They may be the two witnesses and end up dead. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about everybody else in the entire world. You do not elude the great swallower. The great swallower, death, swallows everyone. You will not elude this. There is no fountain of youth. Ponce de Leon wandered through Florida but came up empty. Then they built the villages. He'd still be there if they had them. <laughs> but Ponce de Leon came up. There is no fountain of youth. The great swallow. Death swallows everyone. But Paul, referring to Isaiah, says death is swallowed by victory. The great swallower is swallowed. The great consumer is consumed. The one who inspired fear <laughs> is in the belly. It's all gone. It's nothing. But then he goes on to talk about our text scripture. And in verse 55, he says, O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your sting? victory. In Hebrews, he says, they were, I guess I'm going to have to flip. Let me do some flipping. Okay. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. O oh, grave. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? I will ransom them from the power of the grave, and I will redeem them from death. You know, it's interesting. Jesus spent three days in the grave. I got these keys six years ago now. And they, you all elected me to be an elder here, which was such a great privilege. They gave me this roll of keys. You know, Elder Tom, I still don't know what all of them go to. <laughs> but I have figured out in the last year being in here uh, a lot of what things that they go to. And, the, and there's a few keys I don't have, and those locks we just have to pick and break into, which is not a problem, Frank. There's a couple doors in this place that I can't get into, though, Roger. We have to fix that. Um, but for the most part, with this roll of keys, I can get into anywhere in this building. And... Um, for those of you who know what that is. <laughs> and I've learned which ones go where. When Jesus was in that grave, he didn't just hang around in the cave. He didn't just mock the walls like uh, the Count of Monte Cristo. I spent so many days here. He went somewhere. And while there, Revelation tells us, I think it's chapter 1 and verse 17 or so, he tells us that Jesus came with the keys of death and hell. And he went down into the prison house and he saw the keys, just like in the old cowboy movies, on the hook, by the cell, just out of reach, just to taunt people to try and stretch their arms. And he took up the keys and he went to every cell and he unlocked it and said, you are free. But you, Christine, don't take the yellow key. You take the blue key because you're wearing blue today. And I want you to know 
you are free. And oh, Katie, you have the beautiful lavender dress. Lavender, you are free. And oh, wonderful Donna Maria, that's almost pink, but it's a little bit of yellow. I'll use two keys, and you are free. He came with the keys of death and hell, and he set us free. Amen. And there's no lock, there's no door, there's no power that can hold us down. There's no stone that can hold us in. There's no grave clothes that can bind us up. There's no guards posted outside that can hold us back because he's broken the power of death, of hell, of the grave. He's broken those powers. He came up with the keys of death and hell. Oh, it's so, Resurrection Day is so wonderful. It's so special what he has done, what he has done. And it says, oh, grave, oh, death, where is your sting? That's referring to the scorpion. And you know what it's saying about the scorpion stinger? It's saying that Jesus took all the poison. You stung me so much. Sting me again. Sting me again. Sting me again. I'm drinking the cup. I'm taking it all. Go ahead. Whip me again. Whip me again. Whip me again. Leukemia. A cancer. A COVID. All the diseases. Every lash. You got another one in you. There's another disease. You forgot a lash. Go ahead. Scorpion. Sting. Get it all out. Because where is your sting? Your sting is there, but there's no poison left in it. Because Christ has taken all the poison for us. Oh, death, where is your sting? We will gather. We will sing. We will weep. We will mourn. But really, death, where's your sting? Your, your sting has no bite anymore. We're sorry to see them go. We will miss them, but it's not goodbye. It's see you later. I'll see you in a little while on the other side. Because death, your sting, has no sting juice in it anymore. Because he has taken it all himself. He has drunk the cup of the wrath of God for me, he has taken on death. For me, he has taken on sin and become sin. For me, he has taken on the curse and become the curse. For me, there's no more power in death. There's no more curse in the curse. There's no more wages in sin. The wages of sin is death, and he conquered death. I'll say not to flip back and forth. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Oh, grave, where is your victory? You were victorious long enough. You were victorious from Adam. You were victorious in Cain and Abel. You were victorious in all the generations of Adam. You were victorious all through the years. In Romans, he says the the death reigned from one to another. It was, it was after Adam's fall. It wasn't after the similitude of Adam. It wasn't the same sin as Adam, but it nevertheless had the same consequence. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. <coughs> and Hosea would say, I will ransom them from the power of the grave, and I will redeem them from death. I will pay the price for the power of the grave. I will buy them back from death. It'll have no power on them. It'll have no control of them. And oh, death, I will be your plague. I will be a plague to you. It was a flip. It's a turn. You have chased and hounded and haunted my people for thousands of years. 
You have been a plague. You have been a torment. You have been a destruction. But I am going to do the same to you. I am going to be, O death, your plague. And I will be thy plagues. And O grave, I will be your destruction. You have destroyed homes. You have destroyed lives. You have destroyed families. You have destroyed... So I will be, O death, your destruction. And let me read the last part of this verse in, in, in uh, Hosea. And repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. When we look at that, I know how we look at it. We look at repentance always applies to me. What it means is I'm not going to have any mercy. In my destroying death, you can cry all you want, death. I am not letting up. Hell, you can cry all you want. I am not letting up. When it says, I will have no repentance, I am not having any mercy, is what God is saying. Against death, against hell, against the wages of sin, against all of the things that have beaten and crushed my people. When I judge death and hell and the grave, I will do so without mercy, without repentance, without taking back, without any slack. I will do so with every thing that is within me. And all of the wrath, all of the, the condemnation, all of the, the dregs of the cup that Jesus drank, I'm going to pour them out on you. Oh, death, I'm going to pour them out on you. Remember the movie The Green Mile? And the guy sucked in all that crazy stuff, right? And healed the one guy. And then the other bad guy he let him have it. He took it from this one, and he gave it to that one. And what Christ is saying, I took the cup, and I drank it on their behalf. I took it into me. But you all dirt. But you all grieve. I'm giving it too. <laughs> it's hard to preach with not using your mouth, John. <laughs> I took it all and I'm giving it to you and I'm doing it without any mercy. This is Resurrection Day. Don't you love this beautiful thing that Julie made? I saw it and came in and I had to call her and tell her, Johnny reads my notes when he does worship and comes up with just the right songs. You guys copy my stuff and, and know just what I'm preaching. And so I had to call her and I say, Julie, do you know that the slide that I, I selected and gave to Marissa the day before? No, it was 5, 30, 5 o'clock in the morning, yesterday morning. I was, as we were still in prayer, I snuck in the office because it occurred to me and I sent her, this is the picture. And I sent her that picture and I came in here yesterday afternoon and I saw that and it's like, man. But they, they're all reading my stuff. I put a lock on the door. How beautiful. Because it's a new day. It's resurrection day. Stand with me. In all of us celebrating, in all of the wonderful and joyous activities that we have planned for this day, I want you to remember something. It's resurrection day. And death has no more sting. The grave has no more power. When we go through death now, especially the death of those who know the Lord, we celebrate because it is a passing. It is going through a door. It is going usually through a door that we leave on this side, suffering infirmities things that have held us back and God takes us to the door and he says no come on this side when I went through the legacy of Genesis chapter 5 and he died and he died some of you saw me skip right over Enoch well you know there's a story about Enoch and it goes like this it says Enoch walked with God and one day as they were walking God said well Enoch it's a long way back. We're close to my house. Why don't you just come with me? Instead of going all the way back, 
And Enoch said, that sounds like a wonderful thing, God. I'll go with you. And so Enoch just went home with him. And sometimes that's how it is. In this life, sometimes we walk with God and we get to the place where he says, we're closer to my house. I think you need to just come home with me. And we're left behind sad, but really it's a glorious thing because they're in his presence. They're with him. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. Resurrection power is alive and well this morning. Amen? Amen. 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 Father, bless your folks this morning. Bless your folks this morning. Have your way, oh God, with your people this morning. You send them out, Lord. Let them be like, like lamps, like flames of fire running through the streets to lighten up every, every occasion, every place where they may go today to be a light and to be a blessing. And I pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. And God bless you.